Good morning. Three days through the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, chapters 1 to 5 this morning. Uh, Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. We know he was a Jew. We know he's living at around 64 AD, just before Paul's um, martyrdom, because he would have mentioned Paul's martyrdom, because he's clearly part of the inner circle of Paul. He's talking about how he and Timothy are going to come to them shortly. It's being written to the Jewish Christians, probably in Jerusalem, to the church in Jerusalem. And at this time, there is a serious problem in the church in Jerusalem with the temptation to backslide. In particular, there is this obsession with angels. And that's probably a reference to Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a heresy at the time of the early church. Many of the New Testament letters are are directed at Gnosticism and, and counteracting it. One of the things they believed was there were these, these kind of levels in, in the kind of spiritual realm of, of wisdom. And you had to pass through these various levels in order to get to the pleroma, the fullness, you know, and then be absorbed into the fullness of the universe or something. And, and there were these custodians of these various levels, these strata, as you, as you grew in the special um, secret wisdom and the custodians were angels and then you would somehow be enlightened and then you'd be able to enter the next level of wisdom. It reminds me of, of a Scientology that there are these like, levels of wisdom that you meant to get and then get to the top somehow. Well, the writer is counteracting this and virtually all five chapters we're reading this morning um, are addressing why Jesus is superior to angels. You don't pray to angels, you don't put your faith in them. They do their job, they are ministering spirits, and they are sent to minister to us. And we will have more dignity than angels in the life to come. For now we've been put a little lower than the angels, but on that day we're going to be exalted, and all things are going to be put under our feet. Now, I know we don't see that right now. We don't see the whole creation put under our feet. The animal kingdom rebels against us. The, the natural world rebels against us. We suffer in this world in which we live. It's not put under our feet. We're not the, 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 um, the custodians or the guardians or the masters of creation, are we? So we don't see that yet. What do we see? That's kind of the promise of that. We see Jesus. He was made a little lower than the angels too. He came into the world. In order to suffer, we see him now crowned with glory and honor because he's received his resurrection body. And, and that's what's going to happen to us. We're going to also receive resurrection bodies. He's the first fruits. We will follow. And on that day, we will have all creation under our feet. Don't worry about angels. Maybe that's for you this morning. But the purpose of this whole discussion so far in the book is it's, it's one simple message. Do not backslide. Do not lose your faith. Now, I don't want to get into the argument, were these people really saved? Can you lose your faith? No, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. If you're truly saved, you will persevere to the end. Or God will discipline you and put you to sleep, as we saw in Corinthians. But I think this is talking about a church, some of whom may not be saved. And now they're tempting others to, to desert the faith and go back to some of these weird things. So here's the word. Let's read from uh, chapter 11, uh, sorry, chapter 4, verse 11. Before we read that, just get the context. So he's just quoted Psalm 95, which quoted God from the wilderness when Moses was in the wilderness with the children of Israel. Let's go back to the very beginning. Moses, children of Israel, in the wilderness, God says, right, tomorrow you're going to enter the promised land. And then they send spies in and they, oh no, there's giants in the land. And then they, they don't believe God, they have no faith. And so they can't enter in. And God says, you will not enter my rest because you did not believe. Now David, so then the, 40 years later, they're all dead in the wilderness. And Joshua takes the next generation into the promised land, right? Then David a few hundred years later, says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as in the day of rebellion, when they refused to enter the promised land. Today, don't harden your heart. Because at that time, he said, you won't enter his rest. 
and neither will you. But that's not surprising because isn't didn't Joshua give them rest when he took them into the land of Canaan? No, he didn't. Because the promised land was just a shadow, a type, a prophecy of our rest that we will have one day in heaven. And that in some senses when you're saved, you will really enjoy today. You have rested from your works. So then the writer to the Hebrews quotes David and he says, he now says to the Jewish Christians of his day in Jerusalem, Today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And then he's got this argument. He says, listen, if because David quoted this, clearly Joshua didn't give them the rest that God is speaking about. There is still a rest that we have to enter. And how do you enter? You enter by faith. And if you give up your faith in Jesus, you are giving up the rest of God. Just like the children of Israel did in the wilderness. And just like David said to the people of his own day. That they must not harden their hearts. So too I am telling you now today. Don't harden your heart. And that is a message still to us today. We are not to harden our hearts. And start drifting away from the faith. Because it happens to many. Okay so let's read. First of all the exhortation not to backslide. And then let's read the promise of help. What do you do? Where do you look when you are tempted? And you feel your faith is failing. What do you do? From verse 11 of chapter 4. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. And of joints and marrow. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You're going to be held accountable to what God has revealed in his word. And this thing, my friends... Leaves no space for wriggle room with sin or a lack of faith. This book makes a complete and exhaustive search of your conscience, of your sin, of your life, of your intentions, of your thoughts, of your actions. And the one who wrote this book, his eyes are upon you and you are naked before him and he sees everything. You cannot hide you cannot just drift away and, and lose your faith because you are going to be discovered. So, so where do we find help? Well, we continue. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. Yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. You have a high priest. And the role of the high priest. Is to, is to sympathize with people in their sin. But bring them safely to God. He is a mediator. Now we have the perfect mediator who himself is sinless and yet took on sinful flesh. And so he is perfectly together with God because he is the sinless son of God. And yet he is perfectly together with man and at one with man because he himself is a man. He is the God man. And so he brings God and men together. You have a high priest and Whenever you are struggling in your faith and tempted to, to drift away, this is what you do. You come to the throne of grace. You come to Jesus and you pour out your weaknesses to him. You don't have to hide your weaknesses. You can't. His eyes are open. He knows exactly what you struggle with. Do you struggle with alcohol? Do you struggle with pornography? Do you struggle with a lack of faith? Do you struggle with anger and, and losing your temper? What is it that you struggle with? Drug abuse? Do you, do you struggle with, uh, with pride? 
and, and, and a temptation to be impatient with people. What is it that your conscience bothers you about? Come to Jesus and say, Lord, you know me. You know I struggle with alcohol. And you know that this thing is, 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 it is, ensnares me. Lord, you know my struggle with, with, with pride. You know my struggle with, with, with the, an obsession with beauty. And, and that I put my faith in, in, in my own beauty. And when I'm in social circles, I, it's almost like I forget about you. And, and I let my language and I find myself using foul language and, and, and just kind of integrating with the culture. You know, Lord, I, I struggle with, with the desire to be, to be uh, uh, welcomed and, and, and accepted. That I've got this fear of what people think of me. Lord, you know, the point I'm making, my friend, is whatever it is you struggle with, just tell Jesus about it. Be open with him. Come to your high priest because it is at his throne of grace. Not trying to hide from him, but coming to him with your weaknesses. It is there that you will find grace to help in time of need. How do you not lose your faith through what is a very difficult life? The Christian life. If you're going to be a Christian for 30, 40 years before you die. You are going to have many times of trial and testing of your faith. How are you going to survive those times? Continually come to Jesus. The moment you stop praying, you're in trouble. And the moment you stop being honest with, with Jesus in prayer, you're in trouble. Don't hide your, your, your sins and your temptations. Bring them to Jesus, your great high priest, and you will find help in that time of need. God bless you. See you tomorrow.